It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons, presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Use the question panel on the webinar to submit your questions. Or you can hop on Twitter. Submit your questions with hashtag event icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Com. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons. All right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Event Icons. I'm Brant Kruger from Event Technology Consulting. Uh, joining me as co-host today is Alex Platson from Little Bird Told Media. How are you doing, Alex? I'm good. How are you? Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's oh, yeah. Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Yay. Romantic conversation. Well, we're, having, <laughs> well, we're going to have some great conversations, that's for sure, because today we're having a well-deserved, uh, necessary part two to one of our most watched episodes of last year. Uh, the diversity inclusion topic is still uh, on the minds of many industries around the world, and these two guests uh, will provide a, per a perspective that uh, is practical uh, and give you tips and tools that you can bring to your organization and events as well. We're being joined by uh, one of our previous guests from uh, from our original diversity inclusion episode, Audrey Galleon. That was episode 46. Hello, Audrey. Hello. Audrey uh, is the director of market, no longer, no longer the director of marketing at Catalyst. This is your old bio. What's, what's your new title again? I'm now a senior director of business development. That's business right. Senior director of Business development at Catalyst. Catalyst focuses on creating diverse and inclusive spaces uh, to drive innovation. So welcome back, Audrey. Thank you. All right, and we are joined by a very special guest today, uh, Adrian Trimble. Adrian is the General Manager of Diversity and Inclusion at Toyota Motor North America. I really went into my Minnesota accent there with motor. Uh, <laughs> she's responsible for leading and executing diversity and inclusion strategies and initiatives across all of Toyota North America. So we're very happy to have you with us today, Adrian. Thanks for Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Fantastic. So we're really excited to be getting into this topic again. Uh, like I said, a well-deserved part two. Um, so let's kind of dive in and uh, talk to you uh, first, Adrian. What kind of got you into diversity and inclusion work? Sure. Thank you for that. And again, I'm glad to be here today. I'm actually what I consider to be, I'm a human resources professional. All of my career has been in the human resources space, whether that's been leading talent acquisition activities, succession planning, organization design and development, um, anything that really touched the, the workforce of the, of the business for a company. And I've done that for a number of different industries, uh, automotive being my latest, but I've also been in healthcare, financial services, and broadcasting. Um, what really led me into the diversity space was working through a lot of the HR initiatives, I found that there was an element of inclusion that needed to be a part of that to make sure that we were touching all aspects of the population inside the company as well as outside the company. So that's what really drove my interest in it and making sure again that we targeted particularly those segments that have oftentimes been left out of the, out of the conversation, out of the, out of the population, and making sure that we had processes inside that, that brought them to the table because that's truly what was going to drive productivity, innovation, and uh, long-term business sustainability. So I've been able to do that with those, with my partners now that I have a, the role in DNI specifically, but I work very closely with uh, our supplier diversity initiative, our marketing initiative, our, our human resources partners, as well as community outreach. So making sure we look at things from a holistic perspective. Very nice. And Audrey, for those who might not have seen our first episode, how did you get into diversity and inclusion? Yeah, so um, my story was really a story of luck and following interest. I was studying anthropology and for whatever reason, uh, fell in love with business anthropology, which is something that not a lot of people know exists, which essentially is understanding companies' cultures. And so I pursued that and Catalyst is the organization absolutely committed to 
uh, building inclusive cultures within workplaces and also creating immersive experiences to practice behavioral change and to kind of come back and influence your culture. So I've dedicated my career to that and it's been an incredible journey. I'm seven years in um, and, you know, just constantly working with amazing organizations like Toyota. Everyone's coming in with a different perspective and and challenge at hand and we get to come in and say here's some resources along the way and be a partner uh, so it's it's been a really really fun journey for me and just to give a little con uh, context uh, what have you done as far as experience with uh, planning meetings and workshops and conferences and things like that so much. Um, so I actually was an event planner for Catalyst for several years before moving into our formal learning products and program space. Um, so Catalyst has an annual uh, conference that brings in about 800, 700 to 800 attendees, an awards dinner that brings in 1,600, um, as well as just really for me, my day to day now is creating immersive experiences. So that could be for a group of 20 to a group of 300, uh, really depends on who we're with and just kind of leveraging that environment. So it's interesting because I'm in the workshop, training, speaking engagement space, but everything I've learned from event planning comes into this. And so it's a really interesting merge of passion. And Adrian, um, does what parts of your job do, or do any parts of your job have any um, uh, connection to meetings, workshops, conferences, those kinds of things? Absolutely. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, when I was the uh, leading the Supplier Diversity Initiative, we held one of the largest uh, trade show conferences of its kind in the industry called Opportunity Exchange. And for that event, we would have about 300 of our tier one suppliers that actually would come to participate to meet some of the minority and women owned companies that were looking to do business in our supply chain. Overall, we'd have about 2,500 attendees at this event that and our company actually did this internally in terms of the event planning, the engagement and creating the overall experience that would help those businesses meet each other and connect. Um, in addition to that, I last year managed a part of our business that was responsible for our national partnerships in different segments, whether those were reaching out to African American communities, our Hispanic communities, our LGBTQ communities. And what we would do is have major engagements and activations at those at those events that would help uh, those participants understand Toyota as a company, much more so beyond just being a car company. So we like to look at it as how do we create experiences for those who are looking to purchase our vehicles or who may be looking to become a part of our workforce. So we always want to make sure that we're telling a good story and, and looking at it beyond just an event, but again, an experience to get our messaging out. So those are some of the things that I have direct responsibility for engaging either at the national level or at the local level, as well as convening smaller groups where it may just be around diversity and inclusion thought leadership. So those are things that all fall under the responsibility of my team. That's, that's really interesting. I liked how you mentioned uh, the story aspect, because I think when we talk about events, storytelling is really, really important, um, especially with event design. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now in the diversity realm. Uh, what are the biggest you know, priority topics in your work. I know right now in this country, the climate is very tense over the last few years. So how is that affecting the conversations and the stories being told? What I would say, I want to go back to a point that Audrey made earlier about the impact on the company's culture. And that's really where a lot of my work these days is focused is around how do I understand how diversity and inclusion impacts the company's culture? and What are things that we need to do to make sure that our entire workforce has the ability to feel included in the conversation and that they are being respected and allowed to bring their full selves to work? As you can imagine, we have over 35,000 team members across North America that we have responsibility for making sure that we have an inclusive workplace that allows them the ability to contribute on a day-to-day -day basis. So for me, my biggest job is looking at all of those business streams that impact those team members on a day-to-day -day basis so that they know when we talk about Toyota's fundamental principles of respect for people and continuous improvement, that it's a part of everything that we do. It's part of our DNA and it's the culture that we are trying to build every single day for our team members members, our consumers, and our business partners. Are you finding that you're experiencing that as well, Audrey, with some of your clients? Or is it yeah. more broad? 
Absolutely. I think that that's exactly the, the mission at hand. And, and kind of to tie back to your question, Alex, about the experience that is being created, you know, when we, when we do diversity and inclusion work, and for those who are looking and, and thinking about a, an event perspective, what you're doing is creating an environment where people, to Adrian's point, can bring their best self to work and their whole self to work. Mm -hmm. And we want that to happen at events too, right? We want uh, the best experience possible. And to understand how to create that environment, you need to understand the nuances of culture, the nuances of where each person is coming into a single meeting, a conference, breakout session, and, and getting into that very much what I would consider, Adrian, a science of whether you're looking at the metrics, you're looking at, um, you know, for events, looking at past surveys, really listening, and then trying to play with creating this culture where everyone can work. And it's not going to look the same in every single region. It's not going to look the same in every single department. And that's, it's a tedious, tedious task. But the more that you listen and say, hey, we're going to make and, and be committed to making an open space to try this, that's where you can really start to play around with some impactful inclusion work and creating conversations that matter. So I think it's important, and maybe we should kind of backtrack a little bit for our viewers. Um, can you define what diversity is? What's the difference between diversity versus inclusion? I can take a stab at that first, um, and I'll just talk about it from the perspective that we use it here at Toyota. And some folks have probably heard this, but for us, Diversity is looking at the different, the different perspectives, arrays uh, of, of, of aspects that you want to bring to the, bring to the table. Inclusion is making sure that they're all working together. So I like to use the analogy many times is diversity is about inviting people to the dance and inclusion is about getting them to dance together. So you really mm -hmm. do need the two of them working hand in hand. You can't really look at them as two silos. They really do complement each other and especially with, inside the company culture. Yeah, absolutely. I, that's one of my favorites, Adrian. And I, for me, I would say uh, diversity is a fact. Inclusion is a choice. So if you're looking at, um, you know, bringing in uh, people who are different from you, and that, to Adrian's point, could be anything. You know, we often start with gender, race and ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, the kind of common disabilities. There's the kind of check the box area. And then as you dig deeper into the work, we're really looking and, and what we talk a lot about at Catalyst is the invisible dimensions of who we are and what we bring into every meeting, every event that we go to is actually what is going to have such a large impact in being able to execute inclusion. But being able to leverage those differences is the inclusion part, right? How can we take, learn, use what we know and is unique about every individual as an advantage? Um, and that's really where the inclusion becomes a choice. You know, we've seen, you know, we were talking just the other day about, um, you know, companies who are, say they have quotas to fulfill certain um, diverse slates of hires. Uh, in events, you have the pressure of making sure you're checking the box of different diverse representation on panels. If you look behind that, there really isn't any impact unless you invest in what happens next, right? It's not just getting folks in seats. It's about how we're engaging, how we're connecting. And so that's for me, how I would really differentiate the two. You sent me in about three different directions that I want to go. So I want to make sure I come back to, to some of them. Um, I'm just making a quick note actually, so I don't forget it. Um, <laughs> Why don't we step off with um, bringing it back a little bit to events as far as what, what are the biggest challenges that we're seeing in the event industry uh, when it comes to diversity and inclusion or one or the other, since we've established that those are two very different things, challenges when it comes to diversity and challenges when it comes to inclusion. Um, again, I can start there and I'll, I'll talk about it from a corporate perspective because that's the lens that I'm, I'm, I'm using. But for us, when we look at the challenges that we see with the industry, it really is a, around the vendors and suppliers that make up the supply chain and who we are utilizing to actually execute a lot of our activations in the spaces where we're trying to reach either consumers or we're bringing our employees together, or bringing constituents together in some kind of way. 
what we see is some of those challenges are, do they really understand the experience that we're trying to create and the story that we're trying to tell and the messaging that we need to get out? I was just in a meeting with our engagement marketing team yesterday, and one of the things he said to us, and I hadn't even thought about it in this way, is that we have what we call a dwell rate which is how long do we keep someone around our product so that they can, under, they can begin to touch it, feel it, see it, see all the accessories and kind of see themselves in it. So if we don't have someone in the event industry that knows it's not just about displaying the product, but it's about how does Toyota show up as a company and touching different parts of their lives. So if they have kids that they're bringing to those, to those events and activations that we have on set, how are the kids staying engaged so that mom and dad, who we want to have interest around our vehicle, stay long enough that their kids are having fun, that they can stay and then the, the kids can have a good time while we try to, again, get those subliminal messages to their parents about why we want them to see themselves in our Toyota vehicles. So. Those are some of the challenges that we're trying to address working with our vendors. I would imagine, Adrian, that the um, that the dwell rate then is different for different types of people. That you know what what's going to get that person to stop and look is going to be different for various various categories of folks. That's exactly right. Because what we find is, and I'm you know, not trying to generalize here, but if we have a family that's at, that's at an event and they have mom, dad, and six kids with them, you might have a millennial that walks by and says, I don't want to stay over there with all those kids. So how do you try to create a, an experience that's going to touch the different types of consumers that we're trying to reach. I have a question for you, Adrian. I, I, I love that example. And I'm wondering, how do you measure success? You know, you're having this conversation. I mean, obviously, there's numbers of purchasing the product, <laughs> but you're also probably looking at the subtleties of engagement with any kind of a immersive activation that you're creating. Are you part of those conversations? And what is that? I mean? am from a corporate communications perspective. Right. So again, my role is really to look at how the company image is being portrayed. And so mm -hmm. we, the way that we measure that is through our social media activity. How okay. many mentions do we have? How many outlets are we reaching? How many digital aspects are we touching versus traditional methods, things of that nature. Those are, those are the metrics that we can measure and that we can manage and we mm -hmm. can influence from a diversity and inclusion perspective. So for us, that's really important to know, again, that our vendor, whoever is working with us, understands what our end goal is. What is it that we're trying to accomplish? Who are we really trying to reach? Who are we trying to engage? And what's going to be the best experience that's going to get our that's going to create that opportunity for us? Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question to that, actually, because you mentioned social media, and that's kind of the field that I work in. Well, not kind of, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when you're talking about marketing and you're talking about diversity. Um, and social media mentions, how are you engaging with those social media mentions? And are you asking them and reaching out to them to hear their stories about using your product and things like that? Because I think that's something that as event professionals, um, we could be doing more of is reaching out to the people who come to our events and telling their stories and their experiences. And so I'll I give think you unique perspective from the corporate side. Yeah, I'll give you an example. And again, I don't want to get too deep in this because I don't want my marketing team slapping me on the hand because it's not my area of expertise. I'm pretty clear about that. But things that we have done is, um, I, one of the examples I can think of is at the uh, National Council of La Raza last summer, we created an activation where we had license plates that were on a wall that meant something very specific to individuals. They could select a, a saying that meant something to them that was in, that was in Spanish. Um, so the way that we would use that is having them tell their story on social media that we, we could actually track with the hashtag so that we could be able to follow up and understand how many mentions are we receiving from that particular type of activation and have them take the pictures with their license plate and tell a little bit about their story. So again, it, it gets them to, to, for us as a consumer, as a, as a mobility company is what we're now calling ourselves. Mm helping them to understand that it's not just about the product for us, but we want to know more about you as a consumer so that we know how to keep you and your family safe in our vehicles. So how do we use social media and their stories and allow them to tell those stories so we can track them later so that we have access to that information as we're looking at feeding it back into our, our, our marketing processes and our product planning processes. I know that's a very high level answer, but again, it's not my area of expertise, but that's some of the ways that I we see that we can feed into it. <laughs> I love it. 
Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, Audrey, I want to come back to one thing that you mentioned. Like I said, you, you, you sent me in about three different directions there. Um, uh, I'd like to, we, we've spoken a couple of times now about the pressure that's being put on event organizers to diversify their event programming, um, new mix of attendees, new mix of people on panels, all things like that. Um, what advice would you give to folks who are trying to work through this and, and really want to, you know, give a good eye to these kinds of things? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I would say when you're going through this process, first of all, it's not a bad process. I, I didn't want to paint it in the wrong light of saying that bringing, bringing in diversity in any realm is, is something alone by itself is not good. It's a wonderful starting point. It's just really what you do with it. Um, and I would say start with your end goal in mind um, and think about what exactly do you want to achieve in your session, in your panel, um, and think about what kind of out of the box perspectives can you bring. It's all about, especially when you have a panel, you don't want people with all the same background and resume sitting on that panel and you can probably guess what they're going to say. And, you know, so I would say focus on learning about that slate of panelists that you're looking into and pulling out their unique perspectives. Um, and again, I think, you know, Adrian and I both emphasize when we talk about diversity, it's not just kind of that traditional conversation of what makes someone diverse. In fact, if you become very skilled at this, especially as you're someone who's probably creating the marketing content for these sessions, preparing your moderator, it's about pulling out the uniqueness of every single individual. That should be your goal when you're doing your panel prep. What is different about your story? Great. How is that going to build off my two, three other panelists that I have? So I wouldn't focus first about, okay, we want to get different faces on this panel. Let's make sure to bring a couple women because, you know, we always, we always bring men. Think about your why, where you want to go, remember your attendee feedback, and then build from there. And I think it makes the process um, more innovative, more interesting, challenging in the right way because you're using uh, and, and kind of flexing your risk muscle um, without thinking I'm just fulfilling a quota because we got feedback that we need to. So that's, I don't know if that, that hit the mark there, but that, that's my personal perspective is really focus on your goal. And if your goal is innovative, diversifying is probably going to help you get there. So it's really, you know, Adrian, we, we talked about that business case for convincing companies to invest in this kind of work. It always comes back to innovation. It always comes back to what different perspectives can we bring to enhance a product, enhance an event. And that, that's what it's all about. So I, I actually have a unique example and I'm curious to hear one you would suggest in this situation. Okay. I had a client recently who had a panel of people presenting a study that was done and they were talking about the results of the study. Now, obviously they should have looked at the people working on the study in the first place, but the reality was all seven men working on the study were men and they were white. And so on stage, the only panel of the entire event was seven white guys. <laughs> and obviously they all have unique perspectives and they all, you know, were on that study for a reason. Um, but what do you do in that situation? Because the optics are, are there, right? You know, the only reason they had a panel in the first place was because they were talking about the study and these were the people who happened to work on the study. So obviously in the future <laughs> studies, um, they should, you know, make those people more diverse. But what, what do you do in that situation? How do you handle that? I, I can start, Adrian, if you want to give a go. I, I, you know, first of all, I'll say a panel of seven people is way too many. Yeah, that sounds I agree. like a moderation nightmare. Step one. <laughs> so we can start there. Um, Listen, these are, these are the people who worked on, worked on the research and, you know, having a homogenous group doesn't mean it's bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think that if they were interested in talking about, you know, I don't know anything about the study, but um, 
inherently they're talking about the processes. Um, I don't know if it was from a sociologist perspective where they're getting kind of immersed in the content. Um, there's a lot of risk for interesting bias to explore there. Of, uh, but again, I have no idea. Um, what would I do? Ah, geez, I, I would have a smaller panel <laughs> and um, perhaps engage with people who were part of the study not actually doing the research but would be affected by their research results could bring in different perspectives you know why does this research matter to me as a person and as a unique individual so bring in a couple of different folks be beyond the folk the people who are behind the scenes totally winging that answer but <laughs> that's my two minute brainstorm and before we head to you, Adrian, I mean, uh, Audrey, you touched on something in there that I don't think you realized, and that was pot potentially bringing someone up who to counter that study. That's exactly, yeah. Yeah, so that, you know, you might be able to find someone there that, you know, okay, this is the study and we think it's great, but here's an opposing opinion, or you, or you don't think it's great, you know, whatever. Uh, Adrian, you were going to say. Yeah, because actually one of the things, and I was going to use the example again, looking at it from the corporate lens, there are times that we have panels of our executives speak and they may be in a highly technical area and they may not be very diverse because they, you know, it's a very technical area. So we've had situations like that where the panel all looked the same. And what I've done is I will use a moderator who will be, who will bring a different perspective, kind of what you just said, Brand, to ask some of those opposing questions or just challenge the thinking a little bit deeper that may resonate with others in the audience that, that don't look like them. So you have to kind of infuse that, that difference to make sure that you're getting, uh, again, different perspectives and kind of breaking up that the homogenous of uh, that the homogenousness. I don't know if that's a word or not, but the, <laughs> how homogenous that, that team may be. But kind of the Audrey's point, the first thing I would do is shrink the panel so that you don't have so many of those folks <laughs> with the same perspective that's, that's, that's speaking. Yeah, I love Brand Adrian, thank you for that. I, 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 think that's spot on because again, it kind of goes back to what we were just talking about. What is the purpose of this panel? Is the purpose of this panel to regurgitate research results and talk about the, the nitty gritty? Again, I have no idea what study we're talking about. And, but, um, you know. It's probably best they don't say. <laughs> yeah, <probably. laughs> but, um, you know, I think an engaging panel engages in healthy debate you know, healthy dialogue, different perspectives, getting ideas bounced, pushing back. So I absolutely, Adrian, spot on. Uh, one of the things that I know, you know, Audrey, you've talked about in, in the previous episodes and things like that, that we're kind of dancing around is this diversity of thought um, that, not, uh, you know, is, is making sure that you're looking for those opposing viewpoints and people with differing viewpoints, because it makes for a more interesting panel. And one of the things that I love about this industry is it gives, you know, me a window into other industries as we move from event to event yeah. to event yeah. and can see them from the inside. And they're doing, you know, what I think the companies that are going to be the most successful are the ones like what you guys are doing, Adrian, where you're really making that diversity of thought part of the DNA, part of the, you know, the culture of the company, as opposed to only worrying about panels or, you know, the, the marketing optics or things like those, you know, that. Um, and uh, a perfect example was an aerospace company. And they said, if we want to succeed, we have to be more inclusive at the, at the very fundamental levels because we can't all be the same person who went to the same engineering school, you know, if, you know, if we're ever going to succeed. We need those, those other voices uh, in, in our company if we're ever going to, you know, get out of whatever rut they were in or felt that they were in. Yeah, Brant, what you just said made me, and not to put us in a tangent, but it got me in the mindset immediately of what we're doing to help uh, cross-sector, cross-department uh, networking and creating environments where people can not just, okay, you have a half an hour, good luck, you know, here's some champagne, but really guided networking opportunities that can help people who may not be fully grounded in themselves to feel comfortable um, and giving interesting prompts. That's something that Catalyst has been playing around with a lot in our events is, is almost like a facilitated networking session, um, giving people things that they need to, to address together, problem solving, and you're just kind of creating a playful uh, space for people to talk in a different way and um, get different perspectives. 
Adrian, I'm sure Toyota thinks about this all the time. Yeah. Like getting out of your department and, and visible role models is such a big part of the work. Yes. And actually, as you were just saying that, I was just thinking about something, thinking about a, a major conference that I attended last summer. And I remember looking across the, the room at the networking sessions, and it seemed to me that the people who came together all stood and talked to each other. So there wasn't true networking that's taking place. And one of the things that we've implemented here at Toyota is we have groups that we call uh, and there are employee resource groups, affinity groups, some companies call them. We call them our business partnering groups. And it's almost to the, like you said, you have to come up with strategies to, to force that level of engagement with people who are different to get people more comfortable uh, interacting with people who are different from them. Because as a, as, a, as, a, as a people, we're just very comfortable navigating to our own comfort level. So how do you create experiences that will allow people to naturally get to know people who may be different and learn something different because that's how we begin to teach each other insights about someone that may have a different perspective than our own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. So I'm curious, cause I know we've talked a lot about finding diversity and how we can use that, but how do we leverage diversity to make our programs better? Like how can diversity actually benefit beyond just the optics and beyond just the personal interactions. I kind of like what Audrey said earlier. It's really, you know, when you have diversity of thought and engagement and interaction, it, it brings innovation naturally because you have different perspectives, different challenging thoughts, and, and you, you begin to think of things that you may not have considered by having diversity at the table. You get just different just different thoughts and, and, and perspectives and viewpoints that really challenge your own thinking and challenge the thinking of others so that you can have those types of robust conversations. Yeah. So tribalization is something that's really unique and being talked about a lot in the events industry right now, which is the idea of smaller sub communities that have things in common. For example, people who are attending an event by themselves with no one else from their company or no one else from their department and being able to meet each other so that they can network and engage. And I've seen this happen at certain events such as HubSpot's Inbound, where three years ago, it was kind of led by the attendees. It was a need that the attendees had to meet and network with each other. And three years later, HubSpot is now actively engaging and making sure that that community continues to exist. They have buttons and pins and stickers and they have a happy hour and everything. And what I noticed this year was that there was a brand new community that came about. And, you know, this might be a reflection of the current climate in the country, but um, it was, and they used it on social media. All this was done on social media was hashtag black at inbound. And as an event organizer, I don't think they realized that that was a community that they weren't reaching until the attendees said, you're not reaching us. Mm. So when you're talking about bringing people who are similar to together, you know, you talked about bringing people who have differing viewpoints, but how can bring people who are similar together um, and engaging them in that way also benefit the event? Yeah, I, I love that in the sense that HubSpot made it as the attendees can drive and create the spaces that they need. And, you know, Adrian was talking about employee resource groups, affinity groups from the, the corporate lens. Very similar, the purpose is to accelerate networking, right? Make connections, build trust, right? You wanna build trust and gain access to information. Catalyst talks a lot about the unwritten rules of the workplace. It's just cultural understanding and knowledge. If you don't have access to networks, you're not going to get it. And you're going to directly impact your business or directly impact your event. HubSpot's a business, right? This is, this is a key market for them. So um, empowering people to make those spaces. So not always saying, hey, we're going to push you out of your comfort zone and give you some prompts and good luck. We really want to push you. But also create spaces where I need to go back and be safe and build a network that I trust right now. 
and then leverage that to inform my business, inform uh, my events and be better engaged. Uh, that is a, that's a critical part of this. You know, we're not, we're not going to just all go right in and be able to mesh beautifully. We also need to empower people to build communities that matter to them. Um, so I really like, I like that example, especially, especially because uh, HubSpot just let folks create the communities that they needed and gain visibility. I think it's a really interesting hands-off approach. I was going to just agree with you, Audrey. I think that's really important. You have to have both, right? You have to have those opportunities to allow folks to, you know, leverage their, their community within their community, right? Yeah. But then how do you prepare them to, to help them expand beyond that? So it's kind of a, a natural progression that could take place. So you don't want to completely take that away, that take that opportunity away from those who might still need that common, that common ground to be able to build to go outside their own communities yeah. and yeah. networks. Absolutely. And I guarantee you HubSpot next year is going to have stickers and pins and meetups and happy hours for <laughs> hashtag black and inbound. I just know they will because I've seen it happen with the other groups that have happened at the event. Um, so yeah. I, I think it is. Very they, met, they let the community self form first and then, then they support it, which seems exactly. to make a lot of sense. Uh, so cool. <laughs> it made me think of a question though, and maybe this takes us kind of too far off the rails or not, but it, it just talking about the, the self-forming communities and we touched a little bit on social media. Is there any concern of uh, kind of the inward pressure that social media seems to be putting where it's so much easier to find people that are exactly like you. We talk about things like filter bubbles uh, and things like that. And, and this kind of touches on the diversity of thought issue. I think, um, you know, is there any, way that we can kind of help combat that through meetings and events through our industry to 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 help people break out because it's so darn easy to do to just be well I only want to hear the people that I want to say the things that make me happy and I agree with uh, and force ourselves to break out of that any thoughts on on how we can push against that kind of inward pressure I guess I'm just thinking about it again. I'm going back to it from a corporate perspective. Yeah, you have absolutely. to, and I think Audrey kind of said this earlier, you have to think about it from what, what's the end goal? What is the experience that you're trying to create and blend that into your actual uh, format that you're, you're creating? So you start up front by communicating to those who are participating or who are going to be a part of it that part of the reason that you want them there is to be able to get them to express their thoughts and share their thoughts with people who may have a different perspective or to learn something new. If you kind of set it up that way, set up the experience that way, then maybe you can find ways to expand beyond so the people don't just naturally gravitate back to the, the same common thinking or group thought that they already have. Um, one of the things I really challenge myself on just personally is, because you're right, even when I think about how I use social media, when I'm on my, my feeds and I hear so Someone who has a different viewpoint of mine this, this, that just kind of sends my blood boiling, the first thing I want to do is just block them, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm forcing myself to say, okay, that's a different perspective and maybe right. I need to kind of hear that a little bit so I can think about something that may challenge my own thinking in a way. So, you know, the more that we can create those types of experiences, maybe that will help us to, to, to use uh, avenues to get different, get access to, again, that whole inclusion piece that we're trying to achieve. Yeah, I completely agree, Adrian. I, you know, we, if study after study, The Economist did a great cover on this uh, maybe two or three months ago about how we, because of social media, are more polarized, just looking at the United States, than we've ever been. Uh, more polarized, and I think the, the piece there is because we're in our bubbles, in our social media bubbles, and um, having engaged in one too many Facebook debates, you leave frustrated and just <laughs> empty, um, you know, with this, like, I got to make change. I'm committed. Um, one thing that I'll say, Brand, is with events, you get to create a space where you can set the standard of here's our day together, here's our culture, and here are our ground rules. Mm -hmm. Catalyst does a lot of work. Uh, we have an entire workshop on it, inclusive communication which covers communication style and listening, a lot of listening practice, which is a ton of fun. But what we do is focus on getting out of a debate mindset and practicing dialogue. So if you go into my event, we're hosting it, welcome. Here are our ground rules. You know, there's fun ones, silly ones, and then 
we are committed to dialogue, not debate. If you need some guidance, check it out. Uh, you know, if you're, you have an event app, make people uh, submit some ways that they are committed to dialogue instead of debate, what their, their goals are to, to learn from different perspectives. It's really just creating a space for people to come in and, and engage with that. Because I, I, I think it's fair to say I'm making a huge assumption, but I think that while we are polarized, we don't want to be. We feel that we have a lot to defend, emotions are high, and it could be anything, whether it's the political climate or even just how we think work should get done. I mean, that's why diversity and inclusion is a huge piece that's now involved in talent management, learning and development, because we're finding more and more, this is very much integrated. Saying that someone is not a cultural fit has a lot of implications to, to break apart. Um, so not to go in a, a whole other conversation, but um, you know, I think you have a choice with your event, what kind of tone you want to set. And that's exciting for an attendee. They get to opt in into an immersive experience where, okay, I get a, I'm going to follow these ground rules. I'm going to wear a purple shirt and a funny hat and I can't say X, Y, or Z and I'm going to do X, Y, and B, whatever. You know, I, that's the, the playfulness that you get when you're in event planning, which is why I love it so much. So um, I wouldn't be shy to, to kind of push that boundary and see what kind of standards you can, you can create at your, your event or experience. And, and Brent, I think one of the things that you mentioned in the question was, how do we break out of, you know, this, this bubble? And how do we do that with face-to-face -face events? I think in some ways it's easier because you have to physically be present, but people still speak with their feet. And I've been in controversial mm. keynotes where people have walked out. And so, I mean, can it be better face-to-face? -face? Absolutely. But I think there's still, I think you have to want to break out of your bubble in order to allow yourself to do so. And I don't think everyone has that mindset. Oh, absolutely. But I think, you know, our, our two guests here have offered two great ideas of how you can do that, mainly dealing with being upfront uh, and saying that this is, you know, from the beginning where, you know, this is what we're, this is gonna be all about between the networking uh, suggestions that Adrian had and between the debate versus discussion that Audrey had, which I love that. And um, we've got, we're starting to run a little bit low on time, but I would love if you could just spend like a minute, Audrey, just expanding a little bit on the debate versus discussion point, because I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, so a similar theme to uh, exactly what we've been talking about is understanding your end goal of why you're engaging. And we, we look at this from the perspective of meeting dynamics in particular. So um, if you have a business objective, a deadline, um, if it's an innovative discussion, you, you obviously have a goal that you're trying to, to meet. Um, and this, this actually gets into a lot of interesting conversations around confirmation bias, kind of studying and understanding the perspective we bring at an unconscious level and how we are inclined as humans to defend our positioning before we're even conscious that we're defending our positioning. <laughs> and so helping individuals see and be conscious of checking themselves and saying, oh, I'm engaging in a debate instead of a dialogue or a discussion. Um, it's literally learning how to check yourself. It's, it's habit development, it's behavior, it's behavioral change. Um, so, uh, you know, a debate meaning that I have one perspective and you have another perspective and your perspective is wrong. So let's duel. <laughs> um, and a dialogue is actually a common goal. And oftentimes there is a common goal when you're debating, you want to understand what's going on with this other person. Um, and that is the only goal that will achieve anything. So if you're going into a conversation and saying, I want to achieve this, how are you going to best get there? Probably not through a debate. Um, so it's, it's the way that we do the work is through practicing um, and creating a safe space where you can practice because it's very scary to do in the moment, it's very scary to call out bias when it's happening microaggressions, whatever it is, 
Um, even if you're looking at a slate to hire some folks and now we're get, getting the corporate corporate uh, work that Adrian and I do, but you know, it's, it's the same kind of mindset as learning and flexing new muscles on how to check yourself and how to check others, which is really difficult. So I know we've got a little bit more time. So this might be like the last question before we get into our typical last questions. <laughs> um, in your own words, what are the benefits of addressing this topic as an event planner and how can we be influencers in this space? I'll start um, not as an event planner, but as someone that employs and partners with event planners as we create experiences together. Um, I think that some of the things that's really important is, and we kind of talked, touched on this earlier, is understanding um, how do what when you have members who are attending your event what do you want them to remember when they leave how do you want them to feel when they leave and then that will drive everything that needs to be put into place to help achieve that end goal one of the things that i challenge the partners with that i that i work with um, is to make sure that they're bringing in um, partners that they're working with that can help maybe bring different niches or different um experiences, qualifications, things that we may not have at the table that can help us build a broader approach to an event. And again, it's, it's that inclusion and taking it just beyond working directly with a partner, but making sure we have inclusion throughout our supply chain or our vendor chain as those that we are working with that's helping us create these experiences. So I think that one of the things that I expect or that I communicate with those that we work with is make sure that the people that you're bringing to the table also have the ability to understand the experience that we're trying to achieve and ways that they can help us get there and what's their value add they're bringing to the table and their, their inclusive lens that they're bringing that may help us catch something that ordinarily we might miss because we aren't as close to some of the um, attendees that we would like to be. Mm. Absolutely. I love having this corporate lens. It's, <laughs> it's so, and you know, I think a ton of our listeners are inherently working with, with corporations. So it's, it's just such a great lens to have. Um, so I would say in the event world, we talk a lot about um, innovative event design where uh, event professionals are now thinking about engaging in all senses for their attendees. You know, what kind of sense am I creating? What am I hearing? Um, create, you know, making people surprised and all these different emotions that can trigger memory. So Adrian was just saying, what do you want people to remember when they leave? There's, we know, and there's so many amazing people in the event industry now that have literally mapped this as a science. And I'm looking at Brant because we, we've done previous podcasts together on this several times. It's fascinating. Um, and when you're part of this, part of this piece is discomfort and creating a little bit of, I'm not sure where I stand with this. I'm that kind of feeling of, I'm not quite sure yet. And with events, you get to do that. Uh, and they're, they're just like in any kind of scale of measuring risk, there's going to be some ups and downs, but guaranteed that individual is going to remember it. And they're gonna think about it. And whether they talk about it or not, they will. And it puts the memory and the experience in a different way. Now, I'm not saying make an event that makes people uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is that behind creating different unique experiences, bringing in people that you may have not engaged with before. Be open to the fact that no matter what, you're gonna create impact and you're going to create different memories and a different experience. We all know what a standard event looks like. We've all been to them. And yeah, I remember aspects of it. They had Cheetos out and it was kind of weird and it was good and I'll remember that. I don't know why. You know, silly stuff like that on a, in an event that's so standard. But imagine if you're doing something that's completely out of the realm that you usually do. Well, and the things that we got out of talking to folks who were talking about psychology of events is that you can't keep hitting the same note. If you just keep yes. hitting joy, 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 you have yes. to keep getting higher and higher and higher and higher. And it's, it's you know, almost like addiction level events. So you, you have to intermix things. So why not 
do something that you know again makes it's a different a different emotion involved so yeah bring bring along a little get you a little bit out of your comfort zone but i mean that's how half of what team building events are right get you a little yeah. out of your yeah. out of your comfort zone and working together 100 percent yeah <laughs> Uh, well, uh, Alex, you want to take these last couple and bring it home? Sure. So this is a question we ask all of our guests. If you could only pick one, and I know it's, it's hard to pick one, what is your <laughs> one tip you have for event planners who are trying to integrate inclusion into their events and are nervous about where to start? My one tip would be... Um, Again, making sure that you know your customer, and I'm thinking again from my corporate lens, know your customer's um, expectation, their value add, and what they want to get out of that experience. And again, for us at Toyota, it's never about an event. Anything we do is going to be around the experience, whether that's an experience around those that we're trying to recruit to work with us from a talent acquisition perspective, around putting our product out and having consumers that have an interest in it, or even the things that we do in the community where we're just talk, talking about our brand, making sure that you know that what, what it is we're trying to accomplish by engaging with our audiences and what you can do to bring those different perspectives that we ordinarily might not think about. Because when I'm doing an event or my team is doing an event, I have 101 other things going on. So I'm not paying attention to a lot of those, those nuances. That's what, I, that's what I need my partners there for. So I always make sure that they know that, they, that we're expecting them and we're counting on them to understand that experience and how we communicate those messages about our company. So that our, those who leave see us as more than just a, a product, they see us as a, a true value partner in the community that's, that's, trying, that's trying to engage with the people that we're trying to reach. That's great. I don't know if I can top that, but I'll say. <laughs> of course you can, Audrey. Of course you can. <laughs> I would say my, my one thing, just one thing. Um, I would focus on if you don't know where to start, if you're nervous, understand that there are so many people whose lives are dedicated to this work and to reach out and network. If you don't know where to start, you know, we've had folks reach out and say, you know, we're looking to diversify this event XYZ. We have a conversation and just brainstorm with people. And don't be afraid about saying the wrong thing or thinking that, you know, this is something that will upset some people versus others. You know, the, there's so many different roadblocks to this kind of work and to really dive in. Um, focus on your end goal and engage in a dialogue with other people and reach out. Don't be afraid to reach out and, and just ask. Um, and I guess I'm putting myself out there. If you want to ask me, you can. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> We're here to help. So the last question we always like to ask, um, and I think, you know, I was thinking about this. We just hit our hundredth episode. And I think we've had like 175 guests. So wow. I imagine this resource list is extremely long right now but we want to hear your favorite resources honestly one of toyota's favorite resources catalyst so <laughs> i didn't even tell her to say that <laughs> but it's the truth <laughs> but it is i mean there are as, as audrey said there are a lot of folks out there that have experience in this space and and when you attend other events you get some ideas from them don't be afraid to utilize those as resources. So I always say, go to the professionals, go to the folks who have that in-depth knowledge. And, and, and again, Catalyst has been a great partner for us. So I can't think of anyone else that I would, I would use or mention as a resource. I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. Yeah, well, we've been around for a long time. And so we've been working really hard in this space. And um, I, thank you. Um, why don't I do a personal one, just kind of off the charts that helps me think differently and grounds me. Uh, so non-work related, Audrey, but just Audrey resetting in life. I may have talked about this before, Brant, but the book, The Four Agreements. Um, so it's, it's a book by Don Miguel Ruiz. And basically what he's done is created a standard of four agreements that you can live your life by. Be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personally. Don't make assumptions and always do your best. Made a word for, always do your best. Um, 
this for me resets me and really helps me leverage difference of thought and engage in conversations that really matter. I read the book once or twice a year. It's like this big, it's really easy. Um, and just kind of a fun reset button. I don't know why that's what's coming to mind right now, but I would say if you're looking to just kind of see a bit of where you wanna go as an individual um, and step into new territory, it's a really nice way to get started. Very nice. Alex, you wanna throw anything out there? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell you I was going to do that. I just wanted to give, I had one, so I wanted to make sure I gave you the opportunity of one. And that was uh, uh, just, just uh, this last week, we had a passing uh, of a, a great in kind of the uh, internet world of John Perry Barlow, um, who was a fascinating guy. And he was a, a lyricist for the Grateful Dead, one of the founders of the EFF. But beyond all of that kind of technical stuff, he wrote a very amazing essay uh, that was basically all of the things that he felt he needed to do as a grown-up. And he wrote it when he was about, there was 25 principles of adult behavior. So it's well <laughs> worth a Google. Uh, I'll give you just a couple of them to get to, to kind of uh, give you a taste for it. Number one is be patient no matter what. Don't bad mouth, assign responsibility, not blame. Say nothing of another you wouldn't say to him. Never assume the motives of others are to them less noble than yours are to you. Expand your sense of the possible. Don't trouble yourself with matters you truly cannot change. And then 20 more uh, most excellent uh, advice for being a grown up in this world. Mm -hmm. um, so if you get a chance, please Google that the uh, 25 principles of adult behavior by John Perry Barlow, who uh, again was kind of a, a titan in the, in the founding of the internet. So that's mine. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Audrey and Adrian. I really appreciate it. Adrian, where can people find out more about the work that you're doing? Is there uh, some place where they can find out more about diversity inclusion at Toyota or just in general? Absolutely. Please check out, uh, we've actually just completely rebranded our website for diversity and inclusion. It's oh. toyota.com slash careers. Uh, if you go onto that, that website and click on the diversity and inclusion tab, it will tell you all the things that we're doing in the diversity and inclusion space. Nice, nice. And Audrey, where can folks find out more about you or maybe ask you the questions that you so generously offered to answer? You can find me on LinkedIn. I like to connect there. Um, that's the best way to go, Audrey Gallion. Um, and if you want to check out Catalyst, we're catalyst.org. And we have a lot of really great resources. Um, you know, if you're thinking about even just meeting planning, um, a lot of resources to kind of help you with, with that and creating inclusive meetings. So thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. Very nice. Thank you guys both for joining us. Uh, Alex, another great episode. Thanks for being my, my co-pilot here. Uh, where can folks find out more about you and what you're up to these days? I'm everywhere on social media. <laughs> um, you really are, dude. <laughs> um, so you can It's like find it's your me. job or something. <laughs> it's like it's my job. Uh, you can find me anywhere on social media at A Plaxen, A P L A X E N. And actually, uh, right now you can find me in the February issue of the meeting professional which is guys publication. Ooh, nice. uh, I was just featured there and my name's on the <laughs> cover feels very special awesome. a little self motion never hurt <laughs> nice. um but yeah so you can find me anywhere and uh, feel free to connect me on twitter facebook linkedin it doesn't matter yay yeah alex is totally the man to follow when it comes to social media i'm brant kruger event technology consulting i'm at brant kruger on twitter and pretty much everywhere else and uh, <laughs> i hope you'll reach out and contact me there um that pretty much wraps it up for another episode of event icons a little bit of housekeeping Event Icons is recorded live every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you can watch behind the scenes on Facebook Live. Hi, Facebook Live. We see you there, and we usually start that up, fire that up a couple minutes before the show so you can see us pushing buttons and staring blankly into the screen. Uh, but we do try and pay attention to your comments uh, as they come in there as well. Um, uh, then it's released the following Tuesday on iTunes, Pocket Cast, Stitcher, or wherever your favorite podcast app is, and also, of course, on event-icons.com, along with the show notes and all of the links to all of those wonderful resources that we talked about they'll all be found there every tuesday but the best way for you to 
join us is to sign up at event-icons.com. You can join the chat live here on Zoom, connect directly with the icons of the event industry, ask them their questions. Um, a little quiet today. We had some folks just kind of stopping in and saying hi, but I think that's because folks were really digging the conversation. So there was a lot of just like, listening going on we want to know what you think use twitter use the hashtag event icons or join the event icons facebook group let us know uh, what icons you want to be on the show thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next next time on event icons Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the social conversation. Sponsored by Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with Hashtag Event Icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on Hashtag Event Icons. And stop.